Excessive sleepiness. I'm not a big fan of those, those two words together, excessive sleepiness. Uh, it almost means like everybody should have a degree of sleepiness throughout the day, and excessive just means you have too much sleepiness. I'm not really sure I like that. What I like is the word drowsiness, okay? Um, but excessive sleepiness has kind of caught on. Um, so let's use that. Uh, excessive sleepiness specifically means that throughout the day, you're drowsy when you shouldn't be. So for example, right now you're talking to me. If all of a sudden your eyes get kind of heavy and you feel like you, know, you want to take a nap and I'm being a little bit active here, you know, I'm trying to give you good information. Boy, that's excessive sleepiness. You know? uh, but sometimes excessive sleepiness uh, can come about in, in more subtle situations. Let's say, for example, if uh, there's nothing going on right now, everybody leaves the room and you kind of feel as if you're going to put your head down and, and you, know, you feel like you should take a nap. That could also be excessive sleepiness because really, you should not be sleepy until it's bedtime, okay? If you are sleepy, especially excessively sleepy, throughout the day, at any point, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, even watching TV, anything but bedtime, there could be a potential problem going on that is causing excessive sleepiness. You can kind of categorize that into five major categories because, you know, it could be daunting. A patient coming into your office saying, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, and you say, wow, this person is sleepy. You do what it takes to understand that they're sleepy. You know, yeah, I mean, I'm drowsy all the time. Gosh, it looks like I, you know, I, I shut my eyes a lot when my wife is driving or, you know, I've never seen the end of a movie. And by the way, there is a way of quantifying how sleepy somebody is with something called an Epworth sleepiness scale. And, we can talk and that's where we ask a patient to rate from a, uh, from a scale of zero to three their chance of dozing off, zero being no chance, three being, oh, I would definitely doze off, in eight normal life situations. Life situations like uh, sitting down in the afternoon and reading a book, while uh, being a passenger in a car for an hour, uh, while talking to someone, um, while lying down in the afternoon, you know, having had no alcohol, while watching TV, while being inactive in a public place. What is the chance of you dozing off? The average person who does not have excessive sleepiness We'll say it will be around six, okay? But the person who has a number of 10 or more is considered potentially having excessive sleepiness. And that okay. person, you would want to get further information. Those numbers can be very effective for a patient. Uh, patients love numbers. You know, if you do this scale and say, you know what, look, your number is 15. You're pretty drowsy. Yeah, doc, I guess I am pretty drowsy. So my tiredness means drowsiness, doesn't it? Yeah, well, drowsiness has a few causes. We categorize them into five different categories. Let's talk about the duration of your sleep, the quality of your sleep, and the timing of your sleep, and what medications that you take. And that's how an upper sleepiness can be helpful initially in continuing a diagnosis. It can also be pretty helpful, by the way, when somebody already has a known cause of their excessive sleepiness, like let's say narcolepsy or sleep apnea, and you can redo the test to confirm that their drowsiness is actually lessening. The first one is very easy, not getting enough sleep. If you don't get enough sleep, you're going to be sleepy. Just like if you don't eat enough, you're going to still stay hungry, right? And there are some people who don't get enough sleep. Sometimes they do it to themselves. They just have not enough hours of the day. But sometimes something prevents them from sleeping enough, okay? And that's what we call, for the most case, insomnia. Insomnia is a condition where you have trouble getting to sleep and or staying asleep or you wake up early, which means that you're cutting down the total amount of sleep and you're given ample amount of sleep and it's not you doing it, okay? So whether something does it to you or, or you're doing it to yourself and you're not getting enough sleep, you're going to be drowsy or sleepy, okay? Uh, so. So that's one of them, not getting enough sleep. The second one is poor quality sleep. And that's the person who says, yeah, I get eight hours, nine hours. Heck, I'm some, sometimes trying to get 10 hours of sleep, and I'm still drowsy. What's wrong with me? Then you look for something during their sleep. The most common thing that you need to look at is respiratory problems during their sleep, and most commonly obstructive sleep apnea. One of the women that came to see me today, I, I looked at her throat. Her throat is really small, okay? Her tongue touches the roof of the mouth. To many clinicians, that's no big deal. You know, they say, oh, geez, I can't see your tonsils, whatever. That's a very significant symptom. 
the probability that she has sleep apnea is eight times higher than the usual individual just because the tongue touches the roof of the mouth when she opens her mouth and, and just sticks it out without saying ah. And I ask her, do you snore? Oh, yes, I snore pretty badly. So my husband tries to go to sleep before I do so that you know, he doesn't have to listen to me snoring and keeping him awake. This woman is postmenopausal, and she has a couple of other things going on. She's tired during the day. So sleepiness during the day, postmenopausal, over 55 years of age. She has a little bit of a large neck size. She's a little bit on the obese side. This woman has many of the makings of obstructive sleep apnea. So one of the most common causes of daytime sleepiness with normal amount of time slept is disruption of their breathing, specifically obstructive sleep apnea. This woman deserves to be discussed, the possibility that she has obstructive sleep apnea, and then asked to either get a sleep test done at home or one done at a regular sleep center. Most doctors don't know what are some of the glaring, obvious findings for obstructive sleep apnea. There's actually a mnemonic called STOP BANG, S-T-O-P-B-A-N-G. S standing for snoring, T standing for tiredness, O standing for observed stop breathing, P standing for blood pressure elevation, and B standing for BMI uh, greater than 35, so you know obesity. Uh, a, a is for age, and age um, over 50 or 55. Uh, N is for neck size, which is 17 and a half inches for men and 16 and a half for women. Uh, and uh, G is for gender, men are have m more sleep apnea, but postmenopausal women approach pretty quickly the obstructive sleep apnea. So w what we now know is if you have three or more, uh, well, let's say three of these criteria, the probability of sleep apnea is around 80 to 85 percent. Five of them positive, 90 to 95 percent. There are people walking around going to primary care uh, offices that have eight out of eight positive. It's basically they have sleep apnea written on their forehead and nobody's reading it, you know? So that's to me, is a very fertile ground to do something for that patient. Because as I said earlier, sleep apnea does not just hover around by itself. Apnea patients are usually tired. They, are, they usually have a weight problem. 70% of obstructive sleep apnea are obese, and they find it very difficult to lose weight because their sleep apnea is not treated. They have a higher rate of reflux, reflux esophagitis, uncontrolled hypertension, and that's a big pearl, by the way. What kind of things can cause uncontrolled hypertension despite using two, three, or four medicines? One is obstructive sleep apnea, the other one is renal artery stenosis. So these, this is one of a pearl that we try to instill in our primary care colleagues. So, so there are many comorbidities that are going on, and if you don't identify the obstructive sleep apnea, it's just like the comorbidities are still there, and, and really one of the founding issues that's comorbid with them is not being addressed. So yeah, a lot of primary care providers don't really consider the possibility of OSA and do something about it. The third thing is sleeping erratically at different times. Those are primarily shift workers. I have a guy that I saw yesterday, and what he does, he, he works four days between 11 to 7, and then the other three days he tries to sleep whatever, okay? He's sleepy all the time, all right? And he has something which we call shift work disorder. It's a little difficult to treat. The best remedy for that, by the way, is to get off your shift and sleep normally. And what we're going to try to do for him, and he's agreed to do it, is to sleep the same time when he's off as he's sleeping when he's on. He's going to try to do that. We'll see how it works out. But irregular sleep patterns are the third common cause. The fourth common cause is chemicals and substances. You know, people that are unfortunately using illicit drugs, you know, especially heroin, depressants, etc. But things that we give. I mean, we, we doctors prescribe medications, and there is a whole host of medicines that we prescribe, the side effects of which can be drowsiness, psychiatric drugs, pain medications, etc., etc can cause drowsiness. So we have to look for what is a patient ingesting that can be causing excessive sleepiness. And the fifth one I kind of categorize as brain problems. Depression, uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, stroke can cause a uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease can cause it, and especially narcolepsy, which is an up and coming disease for us to diagnose and treat. So five broad categories then of what can cause excessive sleepiness.